What is up, everybody? And thank you so much for tuning in to another brand new episode of Big Boys and Body Slams, episode four. I'm one of your hosts, Zach. Alongside, we have Luke. Um, mm, hold on. I got to do an impression. Uh, Mr. Kennedy! And Kyle. Kennedy! Hey, everyone. Just, Sorry. Just wearing my uh, Luchador Green Bay Packers uh, mask. If you're Great watching, start. This is a good week to watch the video, by the way. If you want to see Kyle wearing a pretty sweet mask. I'm not going to wear the mask the whole show because it's kind of distracting. But the Packers start Sunday. I'm a big Packers fan, so put the mask on the beginning. Are you getting sweaty under there? A little bit. Yeah. With those lights, too. Can I call you out right quick, Zach? Uh, me? Yeah. Yeah, please. Why? This is the first time you started the show and didn't say, what's up, Holga Maniacs? Oh. You messed up, man. This has been a rough start. Man. Let's scrape this. Well, yeah, let's just take it from the top. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> What's up, Hogamaniacs? <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Big Boys and Body Slams, week four, episode four. We made it through four. My name is Zach. Uh, alongside me, I have Luke. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Luke. And Kyle. Kennedy. What's up, everyone? Wearing my uh, Green Bay Packers mask to represent the start of the NFL season this week. You guys should really. You, this is a good week to watch the the video feed if you want to see Kyle wearing this mask. He'll probably take it off in a minute. So if you're yeah. listening to the audio, stop it and then go to our YouTube channel, um, Big Boys and Body Slams. You'll find us I'll, and watch that. I'll be honest, this thing is super distracting and kind of choking me. I think I got this when I was a little bit skinnier in life. It happens. It also, happens. it's kind of like forming your beard into a Fu Manchu, and I actually really want you to just have that now. Yeah. All it's all this book. wrestling knowledge I've got the last few weeks is making my head a lot bigger. The mask oh, that's what it is. Yeah, that's the what knowledge. Is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Anyways, we are Big Boys and Body Slams. Uh, you can listen to us on a variety of different platforms. We're currently on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and we are also on YouTube. So watch that video feed. We're actually getting some. I, I haven't been plugging the video feed at all, and we're actually getting some decent view counts on there. So thanks everybody for doing that. And I got a thing. No shirts sold this week, unfortunately. But listen, if you're against Nike right now for their ads and you want to get rid of their clothes. Use that money you'd buy Nike, buy Big Boys and Body Slams. Big and if you boys. are a Nike guy and you're going to stick with Nike, hey, we support everyone, so buy a Big Boys and Body Slam that's shirt. That's right. Yeah, we, we don't discriminate. Please buy a shirt. We love everyone. Yes, that's at bigboysbodyslams.storeenvy.com. We have four designs. We might have five here soon, so if, now's the time to buy a shirt. Support the podcast. Help us out. If you don't have, if you don't like our shirt designs, you don't have the money to spare on a shirt, that's no problem. Leave us a review on iTunes. Subscribe on YouTube. Uh, subscribe on Google Play and just leave us some feedback on the show give us hearts on SoundCloud if you're a subscriber there there are a multitude of ways to support us and as always like share and thank you for watching what do we have on the docket today Kyle okay so last week I said it was Turning Point 2009 and I was completely wah, wrong wah. yeah it's a it's a, it's a victory road 2011 and no Kurt Angle is not on the card like I said last week but he is on the cover so I can see why one would get confused that's a fair point um, so yeah, this was this was a very famous show, infamous, <laughs> infamous there show, go. Go. Um, for a very devastating reason, which is of course the main event, which we'll get to um, going through. This is our first TNA slash Impact Wrestling show. Um, I think all three of us kind of had Impact slash TNA phases uh, going back. Uh, they were kind of they were kind of they were very relevant in the wrestling scene for a while there. I I kind of have always been an Impact fan. I started really liking Impact when they were on. Uh, FSN 1 or FSN FSN was that Fox Sports Network that the Mariners used to be on back in the day Mm -hmm. Channel 31 and then Impact when I'd get off of school on Thursdays or Fridays or whatever day it was Impact would be on at like 3.30 so when I'd get home I could go watch Impact for about an hour two hours and it always had wrestlers you wanted to see you're totally right no that's exactly how I remember it too I think I think when I watched it, it was on Spike, though. Like, I watched it from, like, 2006 it, area. It went to Spike after it was on the yeah, oh, F- yeah. FSN I, rem- I do remember, though, it being that weird time slot when I got home, seeing it, like, an hour after school. And, I mean, it's just weird because you usually see Monday Night Raw, you know, in the evening times. And so that gave you, like, a little buffer. Yeah, and I think 
when it was on that network, it was in the weekly pay per view phases up until before they went to Spike and had like the big big pay per views. I think they just had occasional pay per views at that time. Yeah, they just kicked up the production once they got hot. Yep, and hot they were. And this was a, still a very good time for TNA. Uh, this was in 2011, but you could kind of sense the wheels about to fall off and and on very famously impact would go into a huge huge downturn which is is now thankfully really kicking back up in a big way which is great to see thanks don Callis. Yeah, thank you matt hardy yeah i mean the broken matt hardy stuff and then don Callis kind of taking over now but this Friends was kind of, of this was kind of like if you looked at it as a roller coaster this was like when they were cresting and like you could kind of sense that you're about to go down this drop um so this was tna victory road 2011 it opened with a pretty decent a very good video package I thought and it was entirely focused on the main event which was going to be Jeff Hardy versus Sting for the TNA World Championship what did you guys think of this video package I gotta just say I was pumped by the song it was uh, All I Want by A Day to Remember and I don't know about if any of our listeners are big pop punk music fans like I am but pop punk Kyle was just just ready. I was ready to two step in I, your living room. I, I, I was doing the Robbie fist bump there because I was never a mosher, but you know I'd sit in the back. If you're not a pop yeah. punk, if you're not a pop punk fan, just just come join the hater side. It's fine. Yeah, Luke hates good music. <laughs> okay, Limp Biscuit lover. Whoa, hey, friend of the podcast. Oh, Limp oh sorry, let's sorry, not, sorry. Let's not. You're just making here. it one of those days. <laughs> you gonna break stuff or what? I don't know. Dang. So after that um, video package, we pretty much get right into the action. I do want to say about the video yeah, package. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just knowing what's coming, the fact that they just lath- they just lathered this on. They were it's- hyping up this main event maybe as much or more than I've seen a main event hyped up like pre-show. There was literally no other Nothing matches else. involved Nothing in this, else. In this well, video package. To be fair, too, TNA is expecting Jeff Hardy versus Sting, which is kind of like a that's a marquee matchup. Yeah, oh, it's, yeah. it's it's like you're the big star now to the big star then. Well, didn't Sting make like a return and then just suddenly win the belt? Yeah, yeah. So they're trying to make a big yep. match happen, big match feel, and then yeah. Just knowing what's coming, man, it's just yeah. It's it's, it's in hindsight, it's it's crazy to look at this video package now. But after that, we do open up, and the first match right off the bat, we get Bully Ray versus Dreamer. Uh, Bully Ray comes out, he cuts a promo on Dreamer after he makes his entrance, and basically says this match has became a no DQ. No disqualification or no disqualification falls count anywhere match thanks to his buddies Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. He's really putting over the evil heel authority figures here um, ahead of the match and decides that this is now an ODQ match, which I kind of ass- I didn't know that that was going to be the stipulation. But once I saw who was in this match, I kind of just assumed oh, yeah. that was going to be the stipulation. So it wasn't a big surprise to me. You got to give Bully Ray credit. This gimmick is great it's yeah, fantastic he, was great. he looks great here too. oh he yeah dreamer looks great here too tommy dreamer for for like a huge a 20 year window just looked the exact same like yeah, he but, didn't he maybe gained like 20 pounds give or take i mean now he's obviously older and let himself go a little bit but 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 here he looks good yeah, it looks yeah. like he here, was taking this here he's seriously. in that 20 year window yeah, for sure. yeah. Um, so the match opens up. It's just can two- I say right oh, quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Bully Ray, <laughs> as uh, he's stating the stipulation, uh, you know, says this is no DQ now. <laughs> and then Bully Ray to Tommy Dreamer, what do you think of that fat ass? That's and, pretty funny. And that was just a, a pot, a that. pot meat kettle moment for me. <laughs> so pretty funny uh, and ironic. Yeah, that was awesome. And then after that, the match starts. It's two big guys brawling. Uh, Dreamer does a crossbody kind of Thez press style move, and they brawl to the outside. It does not take them long to get to the outside and we get a classic spot that we saw several times last week in the ECW show which was someone a man getting hit in the head with a drink uh, I think Dreamer did it what three times in the first like little bit of this match oh yeah yeah and then he did it like eight times later on so there was a lot of, yeah, a lot of fan head. interaction yeah a really lot of fan interaction that. there was a spot where Dreamer handed the chair to a fan and then sent Bully Ray right into the chair the chair actually almost came back and hit the fan in the head which would have been pretty entertaining uh admittedly and then uh probably my least favorite spot of the match was the minion shot uh <laughs> okay. Bully, Bully Ray grabbed a giant stuffed minion out of the audience and just and poor tommy dreamer had to sell this so so was the minion spot worse than the sex doll spot yeah we'll get to this uh, uh, hold on hold on hold on taz taz is on commentary of course with mike today and uh, Taz does not know what a minion is at all. And he's just, what is that, SpongeBob? I don't know what the hell that is. Yeah, and, then that's, that's that's Jeremy, and then he's yelling at Jeremy Borash, who's in the back, JB, Google this. <laughs> so that tells you, uh, this is 2011, what time period this is. That wasn't a bad Taz. No, no. That was no. A pretty solid Taz. Yeah, good. No, friend of the podcast. I, well, I was talking about your impression, but yeah, Taz was good here, even though I kind of met on him. Um, 
Yeah, that was really funny. But the end, that minion shot was just like, you really have to suspend your disbelief to like believe that that could have hurt a man because he's getting hit with a giant plushie. Um, they brawl into the crowd after that. Uh, another another drink shot. Um, <laughs> this this there's a spot that got a TNA chant that I thought was kind of funny, and it was uh, Bully Ray was at the down like the at the end of a staircase, and then Dreamer. I think the idea was he was going to run down the staircase and then do like. I don't know. He was going to take Bully Ray out like a flying crossbody or like a flying elbow, but he like totally just like runs down to the bottom of the stairs and then just like hops onto Bully Ray and that garnished a TNA chant, which I thought was hilarious. Well, Dreamer pointed to a guy in a TNA shirt and yeah, he started that's, screaming so yeah, he TNA, got it TNA, yeah. and that's how it got started. True. But the crowd was hot. The yeah. crowd was super hot for this that, whole match. Um, the crowd loved Dreamer. The crowd hated Ray, but in a way that was like a... Oh, yeah, you're playing your character yeah. right. For sure. Which has always been his Bully Ray character. That's always been a strong suit is the ability to like naturally get heat and, from a And crowd. the dude's trying to kill SoCal Val for like most of this match. Yeah, oh, yeah. He, he takes a kendo stick at one point and like literally snaps it in half like on the barricade right where SoCal is. He really had it out for her this entire match. Um, they eventually get back into the ring. Several weapons start coming in. There's a There's like road signs which is kind of like the theme of the it's victory road so it's a road themed pay-per-view and all those come in there's a trash can that comes in at one point dreamer just gets destroyed with a trash can didn't dreamer also bring in like like one of those barricades yeah for construction? yeah 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 like the road closed yeah, yeah it broke as it was flying into the ring <laughs> yeah and then he tried to set up that table to hit a uh a pile driver a pile driver but i don't but I mean, the table came in later. But the table came in later. Yeah, he kind of set it up in the corner or on the. It wasn't in the corner, but it was on on one leg. On the one leg, yeah. and then leaned up against the ropes, and he went for a pile driver, which got reversed. Um, there was just a lot. Of, this wasn't anything. Like if you're looking for like a classic hardcore match, this really wasn't it. This was uh, definitely two older performers who were kind of working a much more reserved style. There were still good spots, uh, but it wasn't like anything we would see at one night stand last week. Uh, but for what it was, it was pretty entertaining. It was a. It was a crowd opener that got them happy, and they got to see two legendary performers. Yeah, it was yep. it was super goofy, and and you can tell that they kind of used that sort of gimmick to make up for these two older guys. Because sure. there's there's a couple moments. I mean, you mentioned that Luthez body press. Man, that was that was just two fat guys just beating each other up, just colliding yeah. and just like um, falling together. <laughs> right. So they they oh go ahead Kyle sorry. oh I was gonna say but for what it was it wasn't bad at all no, 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 it, it was fun. it was good entertainment it was fun well there were two spots I really took issue with in this match one we discussed was the minions the other one is the one that happened right here um, so this is I believe it was after the table tease uh, Dreamer goes back out of the ring and he pulls out an inflatable doll and Taz says oh uh, <laughs> no actually I don't know what he said I know that um, Mike Tanay said it wouldn't be Victory Road without an inflatable doll in it. I just like, I, don't, I, I don't really know. I had to scratch my head at that. There I must be a story behind that. But anyways, the inflatable doll comes in the ring, and uh, Bully Ray eats a back body drop and lands in a very suggestive position. He's sixty nine. He's, 69 he's essentially sixty nine yeah. in the doll. It's pretty cringy. And then Dreamer puts the doll on top of Bully Ray, puts the trash can on top of the doll, and then does an elbow drop through that. And that really, that really happened. <laughs> and um, yeah. So then we're going to get the table tease again. Bully Ray sets up the table this time on all on all, on all fours. And he looks at the hard cam and says, uh, Devon, this is for you. Right as he says that, there's some music that plays an outcome. Devon's kids? Devon's two sons come out. One of them's wearing a neck brace. I'm assuming there was some table trauma by Bully Ray there. Uh, Taz or Tanay, one of the two said that in one of the impacts leading up to the show, uh, Bully Ray put him through a table. So that kind of is their reason for running out. So they run out in the midst of all this. It causes a distraction. And who would come in through the crowd? I think everybody kind of saw what was coming at this point. But here comes Devon. They set it up. Bully Ray has his back turned. He turns around. Devon and Dreamer. 3D Bully Ray through the table. And Dreamer gets the pin for the three count. Uh... As I, I mean, as many 3Ds as Tommy Dreamer has probably taken, it probably was a crowning achievement for him. He's probably been looking forward to this his whole career, just to be on the uh, the giving end rather than the receiving end of a 3D. Yeah, it was fun to see him actually deliver a 3D. Devon was peak drunk uncle at this time. He was a big boy. And yeah. he was wearing sweats. Yeah, he was bigger he than was wearing he sweats. Was bigger than bully. I mean, you could say he was a big boy that dropped a body to slam. Whoa! Hey. He did it. He did it. Yeah, because um, we're called Big Boys and Body Slams. Oh, there was also one other spot I wanted to mention in this match earlier involving the inflatable doll when Bully Ray dropped an elbow drop on it. And that just got... that. I'm laughing, you know? I don't know about you guys. I thought it was funny. Uh, and that was that. Uh, so uh, 
Bully Ray eats a 3D, and I'm going to give the match two and a half stars. I thought it was a pretty decent opening match. There were some pretty stupid spots, but it was fun, and uh, the two men had really good chemistry with each other. I'm also giving it two and a half. Got the crowd fired up. Two guys that are definitely past their prime, but putting on a good match. And it was fun. It was entertaining. Like you said, there's some dumb stuff, but I popped for the minion. I thought that was funny because, I, I mean, I hate minions, but that was funny, so... Yeah, two and a half stars for sure, and you're right. It was a big, it was a good opener to get the fans kind of loose, uh, get them going. It could this match, as far as like the ridiculous spots in it, could have only been like the first or the second match uh, because that at that point the crowd still still you know humor humorous enough to kind of let this stuff slide and let kind of the the fat man botches slide but i mean these are two fan favorites um who are older in their careers but still can get the crowd going so yeah it was it was a good opener two and a half stars i agree um so after that we cut to the announce table and um they, taz with one z t- yes taz with one z again thank you um they're just putting over this main event like it's going to be the best thing since sliced bread i just thought i'd write a note of that because uh, you'll yeah. see. Yeah, you'll see. Uh, mm-hmm. And then after that, we got backstage, and we have an interview segment with, what's the team here? The Beautiful People and Winter. Yes, and they're cutting a promo essentially saying that they're that they're the best, and they're not going to lose these belts. So Velvet Sky, Angelina Love, and then Winter, who is Katie Lee Burchell. Right, yeah. and then there's, there's a little bit of tension between Winter and Velvet. <laughs> yeah. Brewing. And it's also worth noting that... Uh, Winter and Angelina Love are about to defend the Knockouts uh, tag team titles, and they're essentially putting over that they're the best in the whole wide world, more, uh, more or less. Yeah, they're facing Rosita and Sarita. Yes, Rosita and Sarita. And, nice. Uh, Way to put a little spin on that, pal. Yes. Um, and Rosita, you might recognize as current day WWE superstar Zelina Vega, which I thought was interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else to add there. Well, uh, interesting, yeah. Um, so they come out, and this, I'm just going to say right off the bat, this match sucked. It was bad. It was rough. Uh, there's like hard, there's a lot, there's hardly even, even anything to talk about in this match. There, nothing really happened of, of note until the end, which we'll get to. I think the like the big thing I got out of this was, one, it seemed like Rosita and Sarita were not ready to be wrestling. Right? Yeah, they were really green. They mm-hmm. were very green. Mm-hmm. And also, as I'm watching this, I'm thinking... Winter deserved a bigger role than being with the beautiful people because she was not bad. I kind of feel like throughout the beautiful people's tenure, which was a long time, uh, I feel like that there was just, oh, we don't know what to do with this knockout. We're just going to throw in the beautiful people and stir up drama a little bit. Well, yeah, but I mean, Winter was not a bad wrestler. No, 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 not at all. So what I'm saying is I think she probably could have been pushed a little bit further. Mm Mm-hmm. I yeah, she was that. definitely the bright spot, I think, in the match. She's the best wrestler there, for sure. She's definitely the best wrestler with this beautiful people and the best looker of them, too. I just don't get Angelina Love. I mean, she's been she's been wrestling at this point in TNA for a while. She was... She took she was the, she, I feel like she took the majority of the offense in this match as opposed to Winter. Winter obviously would come in for hot tag spots, but... It, it seemed like uh, Angelina Love was taking the majority of the match, and she was just so bad. Clunky. She really was clunky. So, like, there were so many little botches in this match. I'm going to cut straight to the end. Uh, well, actually, first, I want to talk about the electric chair botch in particular because it made me scratch my head. Oh, so, so uh, Rosita gets Sarita on top of her. No, it's the other way around. Uh, Sarita gets Rosita on her shoulders in the electric chair. They're going for, like, kind of like a slant, like a, a crossbody drop onto um, or a splash Love. onto yep. Angelina Love. Angelina, Angelina Love rolls out of the way, like, very early like plenty early enough that they could have adjusted but instead they go ahead and just she just sarita just drops rosita anyways like by this point angelina love was in the corner when she dropped her so it was like what why why do that well once you're once you're up there i kind of get it once you said they were both green i mean that proves it right there but once you're all the way up there and she is rolled way out of the way what do you what do you do? Do you kind of just like, okay, I guess I'm going to set her down now. So it's kind of like a, a judgment call. But, I mean, it, it does look ridiculous when you try to go through with it. Yeah, no, honestly, yeah you set her down, Luke. You, you just yeah. set her down. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I guess happens. so. And they kind of made the excuse on the commentary team that maybe she couldn't see because her eyes were maybe shielded or something. So they kind of tried to cover for it. Um, there's a few other botches. There's really nothing else of note. And in the end, it, things get... Interesting. Uh, this had Russo fingertips all over it, at least I think. So there's a brawl on the outside of the ring. Earl Hebner decides it would be a good idea at this point to leave the ring, go outside, and try and break this fight up. As that happens, the belt gets brought into the ring. 
Um, who's going for the hit here? Rosita's going to go for the hit. Mm-hmm. She, she's like going to swing it like an like axe. A, yeah, like a chair. <laughs> which I thought was pretty interesting. But as that happens, Velvet Sky runs out. She takes the belt, which causes Winter to kind of capitalize. She goes for a roll-up pin. Earl Hubner's still outside, so there's nobody to count. And then Sarita rolls that roll-up into her own roll-up. Gets about a 15 count. Earl Hubner finally gets in the ring. Counts three. The match is over. Sarita and Rosita win. And somehow it's Velvet Sky's fault. Question mark? Did that about, does that about cover it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was not good. This was already a bad match, but the ending just like... It made Earl Hebner look stupid. It made the competitors look that bad. That happens a few times here. Earl Hebner looks stupid in this match, but he he redeems himself later on. For sure. Um, this and did then not unredeems do, himself. Yeah, this did not do anything <laughs> for me. Um, I'm going to give it a 0.5 stars. It was a botch fest, and the ending was very Russo-esque. I gave it a half star as well, only because of winter. Yeah, yeah, a, a half star because this should have been... I mean, for the talent, I get that Rosita and Sarita are green here, but Sarita especially, I think she still had more talent to put on a better match. Um, Angelina Love, with how long she's been wrestling, there's no excuse. And winter is talented. So, really, this should have been a lot better of a match, but it ended up being clunky. Also... Winter had like lace panties over her eyes when they when they made their entrance. Yeah, she was like wearing a blindfold for some reason. Yeah, I was but like, it was like lace. At first, I was thinking, is she gonna wrestle with this blindfold on? But no, she just took it off before the match started. She and didn't want to see this match either. Yeah, <laughs> no amount of bosom shots could save this one. Nope. That that's that's very true. So mm-hmm. after that, we get maybe the only thing on the show that could have been worse than that, oh, and that is footage from uh, Jeff Jarrett and Karen. I'm going to call her Karen Angle. (laughs) Karen Jarrett, I guess, at this point. Their honeymoon. Um, They're believed to be at Universal Studios. And there's just like a whole bunch of nothing that happens on these segments. They're they're in line for rides. They're talking about stuff. (laughs) With the kids. I just don't know why anybody would have anybody else come with them on their honeymoon. Like, this is Jeff and Karen's honeymoon, and Jeff brings the kids? The four kids. Don't bring the kids on The honeymoon honeymoon has got to be like... For two people, husband and wife, nobody else. Right, but that was kind of like the the point, I guess, was like he was just bringing the... I don't know what the hell the point was. There was no point. Just for him to like rub it in the face of Kurt to, hey, I've got your kids... Like, yeah, and I'm this showing was him a completely good time. pointless. Eventually, he did tie it into like this Thursday on Impact. I'm gonna say something to Kurt. Like they eventually tied that in, but not until the third segment. So this was like just nothing. It was I was watching nothing. It was Looks video good nothing. Pizza. Hey Jeff. This is the kind of shit that got you fired from your own company. Yes, yeah, seriously. Hey, Jeff, I met you at a TNA house show in Everett one time, and you were not nice. In fact, you were kind of a dick. So not a friend of the podcast, mm, like Jeff Jerry. I think it's the first real one. Um, so after that lovely uh, little video, we got a backstage interview with Matt Morgan, and he's calling out Hernandez, saying that he stole his chance to be the number one contender for the title, and that he's not going to live with that. And he's gonna make him make the man bleed, and that's what he promises to do. And that leads into a first blood match between Hernandez and Matt Morgan. Subpar promo. He, he it stuttered. Was very subpar. He stuttered a few times, and he just he wasn't. Nothing was believable. <laughs> but does anybody else remember Mama 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 Matt Mama Morgan? From WWE. Maybe that stemmed from that. I just think Matt Morgan like never had the it factor. He I never, do. He didn't have good presence. You're wrong. He never really <laughs> had the. He never really had it. You know. He never had the the push. Like he was a good what? wrestler. He was a good big guy, but he never got pushed. He like, was just. He was like a generic creator wrestler, though. He had no. He had nothing. Dude, spe- he, there was nothing he was a, special he was a about good him. big guy. He was a good big guy in the essence of he was better than Nathan Jones. No. he... In TNA, he had some good matches. You're wrong. Okay, against Kurt so... Angle and against Sting. <laughs> Stop it. You can't, just not... put the, you, just can't, you can't put Matt Morgan and then Kurt Angle and Sting in the same damn He sentence. wrestled them in pay-per-views. Oh, my God. He was not bad. But not good. He wasn't bad, but he wasn't. He was not, there was nothing special about him. Okay. Except okay. that he was big. Agree to disagree. Mm. Yeah, I guess. I still mm. love you. I love you, too, I guess. <laughs> Um, so this is a match, and this is, as they're coming out to the ring, they acknowledge that this is going to be a first blood match, which you don't see too many of those. Even back then, I feel like. I can only remember ever really seeing a handful of them. Um, but this is going to be a first blood match between Hernandez, who you might recognize now in Lucha Underground, and Matt Morgan, who you I, probably don't probably don't remember. Yeah. yeah. You also might recognize Hernandez as uh, Hernandez in Impact Wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> for a long time, that's yeah, super. Yeah, he, he had a long, he had a long super mix. With him. And he's, and he's also back. Got, he's also got a brand new tattoo. 
by the way. In this match, yeah, this you says, can see this like, says, the... This says, nada es impossi- imposible, which is... That means nothing is impossible. Yeah, yeah. Kevin Garnett looking at you. Hit the credits for this match. Or the info about this match. Uh, so this match started out, uh, they immediately pretty much go to the outside. They start taking, they trade stair blows. Um, there's a nice spear from Hernandez into Morgan. and They're in the ring for a second, that happens. They go back outside. Uh, Hernandez gets this broomstick and brings it in the ring and breaks it in half. And at first he's just trying to like hit him with it. He's choking him with it. He's choking him with it, which I don't know how that's going to make someone bleed. But then there actually was some pretty sound booking in this match, as particularly from Hernandez, I noticed, because Hernandez went to essentially murder Matt Morgan with this broomstick because he tries to stab him in the face with like the broken end of the broomstick. Morgan reverses it. Later, there was a uh, back rake, which you like really don't see. But again, I thought it was smart booking because you want to make somebody bleed. And what's the easiest way to do that? Dig your nails into someone's back and claw them, and they'll probably are going to bleed. He didn't. Uh, but again, I thought that was sound booking. Um so this match again this is another match that kind of gets weird <laughs> like pretty pretty soon into it um so the, the after the back rake uh morgan hits a corner splash into a fall away slam which was really nice um matt uh morgan grabs the broken stick he tries to bring it in and then a fan runs in from the audience and the the referee in this match just like tackled was this that dude. earl who, who was the ref it wasn't there? earl no. it was uh, some younger guy and he takes out the fan the security dude, he comes. trucked him he he it was like hit stick <laughs> if you were playing madden he hit stick to this guy and takes him out uh security comes up and announcers are kind of scrambling for it to do and oh it's a russo work because this causes a distraction which causes hernandez to get a chain again this is clearly a no disqualification match why you needed a ref distraction in the first place doesn't matter and so he tries to hit hernandez or t- tries to hit morgan with the chain morgan ends up grabbing it hits hernandez with the chain hernandez rolls into the corner i definitely thought he was blading here and he might have been because he did have a cut um but the the camera did not cut away from him and he's like clearly reaching for things as he's like selling in the corner and luke and i were just like screaming like cut cut away cut away yeah for the love of god please get um, away it I turns thought, out it turns i thought out, we were about to just watch him straight I up did blade. Too. it looked like it oh. um it turns out that's not exactly what happened because when morgan went to go on the offensive again he gets squirted with like some red like blood, a blood packet yeah. like a blood pack he's got blood all over his body the ref comes in just in time to see this or it's a different ref because the other ref is in pain outside because he took a bump the other ref comes in notices the blood and calls the match for hernandez yikes um this match was decent and then the ending just got wild and out of control and that is going to bring it down for two a one star for me i gave it one and a half i mean i thought the action was all right it was kind of slow kind of boring you can't put two big guys like this against each other the ending ruined it for me keep talking yeah, the ending ruined it for me, so... Technical um, difficulties. Yeah. So, one and a half stars. No, no, this was one... See, I don't agree that it was ever decent. Like, this, <laughs> this is a one-star match. It's just two big dudes clumsily doing uh, weapon spots. That's fair. I just kind of I just kind of like the the logical booking of it, where he was, like, they were trying know. to go for blood specifically. <laughs> okay, he scratched his back, and he tried to stab him with a splintered broomstick. I get it. But then... There was a random fan for no reason that got tackled. So you're forget- I told you it so, got weird. So, but the, the ref tackled him and then acted like he took the bump. Like Matt Morgan kicked kicked the fan out, but I yeah. guess he kicked the ref too because the ref sold the hell out of it. There was probably something on the outside we didn't see. <laughs> but it was right at this point, as soon as this match ended, that I pulled out my smartphone and I looked up Vince Russo's tenure in TNA. And sure enough, this was uh, in March of 2011. He stepped down in October 2011 as one of the head writers. So this was he, right near the end. Yeah, yeah, full force when they just you know Vince maybe and, and, should, and maybe thankfully should. thankfully this did not this show didn't reek too much of Russo. I think just the last two matches kind of had like the Russo touch on them, and thankfully the rest of the show was kind of free of that. Yeah, it got part. it out of the way. I was gonna say after these the second and third match on the card, it actually gets pr- pretty good until yeah. till the main event. Yeah, uh, and that's starting with the next match. And so we cut backstage first to a Generation Me, who you all know now as the Young Bucks, uh, cutting a promo. So the whole story here is that Jeremy, there's Jeremy and Max Buck, who you know again as... as Nick and Matt Jackson. Exactly. And they're essentially talking about how uh, Max wants wants to win this X Division belt, and he wants Jeremy to sacrifice the match. Because it's his birthday. Match. Yes, because it's, it's his... Which so, is awesome. So just to the listeners... Max is Matt and Jeremy is Nick. Yes. Yeah, so if we kind of start switching names, that's 
kind of keep Sorry. track of it. As I was writing my notes, every so often I have to cross out Jeremy or Max and put Nick or Matt because I was going with the Young Bucks names, not the Generation Me yeah. names. I was I was trying to keep it with Generation Me. I do call them the Bucks, but to be fair, that's their that's their last, last name in, yeah. the, in the in the show. And it is so cool or cool and interesting to see just how green the Bucks were at this point. Well, I mean, they both look. A little timid in the yeah. light, but especially uh, Nick. Nick, yeah, yeah. he Nick. really like. He looks like a kid. He he's looks shifting, like he's sixteen he's, in yeah, here. His eyes are shifting around. You can tell he's uncomfortable. They're they're staggering a lot, which you never see the Bucks do now. And it could just be a result of scripting because they're obviously heavily scripted here too. Well, and this was two thousand seven, seven years yeah. ago. Uh, but it's just interesting to see how far they've came in such a short period of time. And I, I'm gonna have a hot take right now. We talked about this during the show. I tip I kind of think the the Bucks are a bit overrated right Wrong. now in the wrestling landscape. Um, and, and this is not I'm not sliding the Bucks. I'm not trying to bury them. I like the Young Bucks. I just think that some of the fanfare over them is a bit overplayed. But I think they're very good. They're a good tag team. They're not. I don't think they're the greatest tag team in the world or anything. But I, <laughs> Kyle's taking his shirt off to I'm fight. About, me. I'm about to rip off um, my shirt, Hulk Hogan style, and just. Leg drop but again, I think it's cool how self-made they are, and again, it's cool to see how far they came in such a short period of time. And that was it for that backstage interview. Um, you, they planted the seeds for the family story about how Jeremy's supposed to sacrifice this match for Max, which was the next match, um, which is going to be the Bucks. I'm going to call them the Bucks. The Generation Me versus Kazarian versus Robbie E in an Ultimate X match. I also want to say, after the Bucks interview, they did a, a Kazarian interview, and this is with long haired Kazarian. Pretty good interview, just saying that he's going to defend his title and he's going to show why he's a legend of X Division. And then we had a Robbie E promo where he was trying to <laughs> this get. This was weird. He was like trying to get a drink or something, and Cookie, who is like his Snooky because of the Jersey Shore gimmick. Yeah, he's just a straight she, ripoff. She's just like screaming at him. <sighs> and he's like, Do I ever not have a plan? And she's like, You never have a plan. Yeah, and then he just gets his drink and walks well, off. He, he gets his drink and says, GTX. Jim, Tan, X Division Championship. There you go. <laughs> and then he walks off, and then Cookie says, I hope you have vodka. And that was the end of that. And then we went straight into the match after that. It um, was weird, but not Lord. Jeff Jarrett family on a At honeymoon. The theme park. Weird. Was just, yeah. We'll get back to that in a bit. But um, <laughs> so far at this point, this is easily, hey, there's a cat. Hi, cat. Uh, this was easily match of the What's night. What's a cat doing in me. the studio? Oh, my God. <laughs> This was easily match of the night for me at this point in the show. Uh, this is when things kind of took a little bit of a, a, a turn. It kind of seemed like, oh man, this is going to be a rough show to get through. Uh, but starting with this match, things kind of picked up and got uh, pretty entertaining. And I just think that the, that this um, the Ultimate X match, which if you don't know, it's essentially a ladder match, but without a ladder. They have two crossing cables that connect to like these big metal beams, and that's how you have to get the the belt. I think it's a great gimmick. So. Before we, Zach starts explaining what happened in this match, just know that he's not going to be able to get everything that happened in this match. Yeah. This match was very good, and go find this match and watch it because I was thoroughly inter- thoroughly entertained. I mean, every Ultimate X match, I mean, at least almost every Ultimate X match I've seen has been awesome. Like I, you were saying, I really, really love this match type. It's super unique to TNA, um, and it's something that no one else really tries to replicate. And it's kind of got the same sort of... It's just a spot fest, kind of similar yeah. to how the Money in the Bank and TLC matches are. So, yeah, definitely yeah, look up is, all the Ultimate X matches. This match like is hot and heavy. This thing moves really quickly. Um, so it opens up, and obviously it opens up, and Generation Me are working together. They take both Kazarian and Robbie E out, and then right when you think, oh, hey, they're going to blow through this match, uh, Kazarian does this really cool springboard onto the cable. He tries for the belt. Um he gets pulled down by Robbie E. Robbie E and him start fighting for a while. Um, Max gets up for the first time and tries for the belt, but he gets taken out. I think he actually just fell, if I remember right. There's a lot of people just falling, but I mean, I, I'm not going to say I could do it. Then that's the whole stipulation of the match is it's hard to do that. So, you know, the guy's falling and getting pulled down does make sense. Um, Robbie E., he is all alone in the ring. He kind of sells to the crowd like, oh, I can totally do this. He goes for the belt. So there's a, the beginning of this match was pretty much just like each guy gets to go for the belt, except for Jeremy, which is interesting because he we wouldn't see him go for the belt until later. And I think that really played into the whole overarching story of this match really well. Um, eventually, um, Generation Me, and particularly Max, um, who you'll know as Matt, uh, really kind of showed that they were they they're obviously the youngest people in the match but they're obviously at this point kind of stole the show i think for a large portion of this match um there was a really nice uh 
Jeremy hit a really nice springboard moonsault off of Max to the outside at one point. And it's hard to explain the spot. You just have to see it. But uh, basically, he uses the leverage from Max to springboard off the top. And just he got some he got air on this moonsault. Oh, yeah. And he flew and took everyone else out on the outside. Um, and then Jeremy and Max decide they're both going to get on the cable. Um, and essentially what's happening is Jeremy is trying to block Kazarian from getting the belt because Kazarian's on the same thing. Kazarian drop kicks him off and then, um, uh, Max and Kazarian fight for the belt. They both get torn down by Robbie. Eventually a ladder comes into the mix, which I just thought was so funny because it's like, Oh, you could just get a ladder the whole time and climb the ladder and make it a ladder match. Um, and this is kind of towards the end of the match. Nothing happens with it for a while. There was one spot that was kind of silly, I thought, and that was when uh, Kazarian kind of kicked Max, and he, like, hit his head on, like, the metal post. But, like, they tried to say he had his head stuck in the post. Yeah, when it's, like, a, a two-foot wide, at least, like, a two-foot wide <laughs> like square. Like, you clearly see, like, he was just, like, sitting there and selling it. But uh, the announcers were, particularly Ch- Taz, was really trying to put over... Oh, his head stuck in the rope. There's head stuck in the bar. It's stuck in the bar. It's like no, it's it's clearly not. Yeah, any any camera shot will show you that. Yeah. So we get to man. I love probably my favorite part of the match. Um, right before the finish, where Jeremy and Max are alone in the ring. Everyone else has been taken out at this point, and uh, Jeremy decides he wants to go for the belt. Like he wants that freaking belt. He's he's not going to play second fiddle to Max anymore. You're kind of getting the the apex of the story. So they both climb up. On the ca- on opposite sides of the cable, they meet in the middle, and they're just twin fighting up there. They're brother fighting to get to this belt. Eventually, I think Robbie E gets on the ladder, takes them both out. While this is all happening, Kazarian climbs on top of the cable and kind of like tight ropes his way over. This While allows onto the top of the yeah, scaffolding. Yeah. This allows Robbie E to climb the ladder, and then the two men fight. So Robbie E's on the ladder, Kazarian's over the cable. They're fighting over the belt. Kazarian gets the belt and wins the match. Um, anticlimactic it was a very anticlimactic finish to the match i was expecting like one more big like hold your breath spot or like an omg moment uh but that didn't happen uh but it didn't really hurt this match too much i thought this was a very solid match overall uh what did you guys think well there's two spots i wanted to bring attention to that i really enjoyed there's one uh nick did a springboard x factor he uh oh, jumped off right. the ropes and then Brought the guy down with him and did an X Factor type move. They did hit. Oh, they also hit their dueling super kicks. That's, that's what I was coming to next. Robbie E was like on the the cables trying to get the title, and uh, the young bucks pulled him down and then hit the the super kick party. Yes, sir. And it was it. It was like it's funny seeing them do that and the crowd not like go insane. <laughs> yeah, TNA severely misused them. There was a lot of moments uh, that we noticed, like, the crowd was really hot at first, but they kind of seemed to cool down a bit, and there was moments when, like, big spots were being hit, and neither the crowd or the announcers were really putting it over. Yeah, the announcers seemed like Mike Tanay should be in the retirement home, and Taz should be just... Doing the Taz show. Yeah. Well, Tanay, Tanay usually, you, or excuse me, Taz usually just feeds off of the play-by-play guy, which made him and Joey Styles really effective, uh, yeah. him and Michael Cole really effective, but when the play-by-play guy is not, like having exclamations when there's big moves and big spots i mean as a if you were a color guy how i mean that'd be pretty difficult to kind of add to that right and that, that's why i like josh matthews now in impacts role i think him and don Callis do a really good job together i agree um, um what oh, do you guys give that match three and three fourths i give that uh three stars uh, i do want to say that a lot of these matches Meltzer. kind of oh, <laughs> sorry man no the ending i actually was pretty sour about the ending um just because it's one of those things where it's like, yes, he's actually being very resourceful, and I guess he could just uh, Kazarian. I guess he could just grab the belt from the top of the scaffolding. That's that's pretty resourceful. But you never like expect them to actually do what they plan to do. There's always supposed to be like it, a it big left spot. you wanting. It left you wanting more. Yeah, yeah. And so I think just the end kind of got a little wonky, and so that's why I gave it three stars. Uh, I do want to say Frankie Kazarian, very underrated, very athletic. Uh, and you said, mentioned he kind of looks like, with the long hair, kind of looks like uh, Antonio he Banderas. Does. If you don't know what Frankie Kazarian looks like, particularly with hair, uh, striking resemblance to Antonio Banderas. And I'm with Luke. I think this was a pretty good match, kind of brought down by an anticlimactic finish. I'm uh, going to give it a 3.5 because I did really enjoy it still. wasn't one of the best uh, Ultimate X matches you'll see, um, but it was solid. But I do want to say that the Young Bucks, that was a really cool dynamic uh, that made this X, or, uh, Ultimate X match different than other ones is that 
you know, usually it's you know one on one on one on one, and they were able to use that brother tag team gimmick yeah. for most of the match, and it it ended up being pretty effective. Yeah, I loved the storytelling throughout the match, and it helped kind of the drama of it as well. After that, a uh, good match. We got more honeymoon footage. I believe this is when. Oh, so there was two things that I thought were really funny about this particular segment. One was they had like clearly had to. So they were all like drinking soda, but they all had to like clearly cover the, like. Their, uh, the logos? Yeah, they had yeah. to like, clearly cover the logos on their cups, so they just like wrapped napkins around them, but you could still clearly see, like, oh, that's a Coke. That's a Coke logo. That's a Coke <laughs> logo. And then Jared comes in, and he's like, I brought pizza. And, like, there's, <laughs> there's nothing in that box. He has this, like, floppy, wet, like, a box he found, like, in a dumpster but at an alleyway, and there's, like, clearly nothing in the box. And you can even see, like, the youngest daughter, like, open it up, and I'm like, is she going to grab pizza? Is she going to grab pizza? Yeah, but, we, like, we were on the watch for that one. <laughs> the camera, like, moves away right at the last second and when it comes back she has a disappointed look and no pizza so i think there's definitely no pizza in that and box. karen angle is just as pissed in this promo as we are watching this crap she's like starting to get pretty annoyed because like kyle said earlier why would you bring your kids on your honeymoon um but the payoff to that will come next it was terrible this was terrible it just doesn't make sense it's just stupid why it is it on matter a why is it on a pay-per-view if you want to keep it on impact on thursday that's fine why is this on a pay-per-view you could have easily had a build to a jared angle showdown without this bullshit mm-hmm. yeah i definitely um you could have done it in one segment and i feel like should, done we, a kind better of, job. should we kind of explain the real life situation for people who might not yes, know yes please it's so stupid. so karen angle was married to kurt angle and in real life decided she wanted to be with jeff jarrett and jeff jarrett married her and kurt angle well they had an affair first they had an affair Thank first you. that's important to mention and throughout all this it's very important to also mention that kurt angle stayed with tna throughout all of this and i was telling uh telling them as we were watching the show i don't think i could have stayed i don't think so either if, if, if essentially my boss did that but then i believe dixie pulled the rope out from under jeff after this all happened so jeff kind of lost a lot yeah. of his leverage that was kind of his first like stint of his big slip yeah, yeah. of several that he had with i was the gonna say how many how many times has jeff been in and out of tna several at this point now he's, he was trying to sue them and he did a great job of starting this company but then he started to kind of be part of the downfall oh for sure uh this was just aw- I think knowing the real life story behind it makes it like so much more awkward to me too. And cringeworthy. It's just it's definitely cringeworthy. Skew. It's awful. I will say Jeff Jarrett though has a uh, top five TNA entrance theme. Agreed. Okay, just look it up. It's that wasn't very good. Sorry. I thought it was great. Uh, so after that, we get to a backstage interview and we got Beer Money being interviewed about their match. Um, I thought it was kind of funny that James Storm specifically called out Shannon Moore. Like, he didn't worry about James Neal. He, like, really just had a problem only with Shannon Moore. <laughs> and so the both verbal and physical beatdown of Shannon Moore continues. Yes, yeah, Shannon Moore, friend of the podcast. He's been on three <laughs> or four episodes now. Yeah. And James Storm also looks like a fat Shawn Michaels. He does. They also, in this interview, this interview is all about respect, but they're trying to get Christy Hemme to do the the beer money, like, dance. Oh, this go down, cringy. They go down to the bottom, and then they go, beer money! But as she's doing it, they're just checking out her ass. And, and they're she, like, shake it, shake it. And she turns around she and she's like, out. oh, you need that more respect for me. And then they, it was they go so on. so awkward. They go on this, like, re, this end up being a decent promo about why they don't like Ink Ink and how they need to have respect with them. But the beginning was just so cringe. You're going to talk about respect and then yeah, try and make Christy Hemi do that. Yeah. Uh, well, and also Christy Hemi, uh, one of my favorites, I think I mentioned that on an episode before, big big fan of Redhead. She was spaced out. Oh, dude, I don't, know, I don't know I don't know what the heck kind of a binge she was on or what, but she looked super like emaciated, like her cheeks were sunken and her eyes were just glazed. I thought she was going to fall asleep during this interview. Yeah, it was wild. Um, so after that, we got a short video package kind of hyping up the Ink Ink versus Beer Money feud. This, of course, is going to be for the tag team titles, which Beer Money are holding and here comes the match beer money is supremely over this is one of the big, i thought this is one of the biggest pops of the night for beer money people love them definitely um if you don't or if you aren't aware beer money is bobby rude and james storm uh, long-haired bobby rude still this is before he shaved his head and turned on his partner uh beer money was still in full uh swing there are definitely baby the baby faces in this match and then ink ink is uh shannon moore and jesse neal who i thought was was someone else, but apparently he's just always been Jesse Neal. We also got to mention Jesse Neal's hair in this match. I think I called him James Neal, by the way. You did. Uh, you know, Jesse Neal. Uh, something we have to talk about with Jesse Neal is that his hair in this match is so distracting. He's got, like, a red, like, like Liberty mohawk, but then he also has, like, a blonde, like, overcut. Like a cap. Undercut. Yeah. It looks like he's wearing a helmet. 
It's yeah, it looks a, like he's like, uh, got a Trojan helmet on. They're, Shannon Moore's face paint and Jesse Neal's hair are they just look so too much. silly. They look silly. I forgot how ridiculous they looked for they sure. They looked really silly, and, especially like 2000. This was like in 2003, you could have gotten away with this. By 2011, yikes. And Shannon Moore has a book around his neck that says the book of dilly gaff which means do i look like i give a fuck yeah which why are you carrying that into a wrestling match i don't know well he they tried using it as a weapon later in the match too um so this match starts out uh neil and storm started out there's some quick action at the beginning and actually james storm was actually moving really quick here um i don't remember him being that like nimble but he was moving quick then there's a stare down and then uh dueling slaps and then storm hits a neck breaker for a near fall right off the bat and then uh, Neil hits a cross body for a near fall. And then here comes uh, Shannon Moore and Bobby Roode. They do a mat wrestling kind of exchange and then a tilt-a-whirl slam to, uh, to Moore. This match kind of sunk in the middle a little bit. It kind of got a little saggy and slow. Um, there was a Miss Bronco Buster attempt. There's a dual hot tag after that to Roode and Neil. They come in, they exchange strikes. There's a couple, like, Roode lays out neil with some really stiff lariats here like you could hear it it sounded like well we'll get to another thing that sounded really good later in this match too but man rude laid out neil with these uh with these lariats um beer money gets some double team moves in they do this like uh it was like a shatter machine type move which is like the revive it was like a like a backbreaker into a code breaker kind of thing or a wheelbarrow. I'm sorry. A wheelbarrow yep, into a code breaker look very similar to the shatter machine that the revival do now in WWE rude hits a classic rude spine buster. Can I just say Bobby rude has one of my favorite spine busters in the business. Top today. Five. Yeah, it's definitely he's got top a great five. spine buster uh, him or triple H as far as like the spine buster Arn Anderson Arn Anderson. Okay, I, didn't, I didn't ask Arn Anderson as, I asked as triple as H what? or Bobby rude between the two. Obviously Arn Anderson has the best spine buster of all time. I'm I'm gonna give it to Triple H, honestly. I'm going rude. Yeah, I'd give it to Triple H too, but I probably put rude number four or five just, on my just list. Just that wind up and then he holds him like they're suspended at the apex of it and then he just drives him down. Like you can tell he's practiced that a lot. Obviously, Arn like Anderson's rock. number one. The always rocks. like the rocks too. Mm-hmm. The rocks had like a lot of like whoosh, like whiplash effect to it. His, his, really nice. All of his moves were just swaggy. There's they like awesome. theatrics to the rock. Yeah. Every time. I wish the rock was on this show. Love you, Dwayne. Huge friend of friend the podcast. Friend of the podcast. Um, and so there was a... Shannon Moore hit a moonsault to Storm. Um, and then he, like, turns around and takes out Rude, like, right away, which I thought was really cool. And then Moore got crotched on the third rope, and that really hurt him real bad. And then Rude um, tries for a super kick, and then Beer Money gets knocked down. And then I think up here was when James Storm took off Neil's head. With a super kick. This thing sounded like a chair shot. Yeah. It yeah. was one of the biggest super kicks Brutal. I think I've ever seen. And man, it, it was it was awesome. And then after that, Moore hits a cutter for a near fall after he recovers. And then uh, there's a backstabber, which goes into the DWI, which is Beer Money's finisher. They win the match. Um, I thought this match had its slow moments, but overall I thought it was pretty effective and the ending sequences really picked up uh, for me and I'm going to give it a 3.8. I gave it three and three fourth stars. Again, I thought it was really good. I just got to say, is James Storm part of the two best TNA tag teams of all time? Oh, crap. America's Most Wanted yeah. and Beer Money? Definitely. I mean, Definitely. yeah, two of the, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Those are probably one and two on the TNA like board. Who's going to be up there. The Motor City Machine Guns, of course, yeah, are up there. But, they're up there. And the Dudley Boys are up there, Team 3D, but they're not past those two. I might have to get back to you on that, man. I don't know. They're up there for I sure, mean, though. Some some forms of LAX, too, are up there. Oh, yeah. LAX is up there. Daniels and AJ's up there. But, <sighs> I mean, Beer Money and America's Most Wanted might be the two greatest teams in TNA history. Beer Money were like the tag team face for a long time of TNA. And well, so Amer- was America's yeah, Most Wanted, AMW especially. Was the team mm-hmm. for like the early years of TNA. You're absolutely and right. And then they split them up and they tried to make Chris Harris a superstar, really. And then how'd that work out, Brayden? Picked the wrong guy. Yikes. Do you remember Brayden Walker on WWE ECW? Yes. 
I'm Braden Walker, and I'm going to knock your brains out. Didn't he only have, like, one match? He had, like, two matches and, like, three backstage segments. One of the backstage segments was, I think, essentially, like, him running in the Matt Hardy and saying hello. <laughs> Dang. Um, Luke, did you rate this match? Oh, uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, three and a half stars. Um, it was it was solid. It was solid. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a lot of... The tag, the double team moves really wrapped it up for me and they did a lot of creative innovative stuff and i mean these are just four really talented wrestlers going at it and yeah th- i agree three and a half stars um i do think like that the, this was a kind of the tale of two halves like the first half which was slower and um kind of more methodical and then that kind of led into the more exciting second half just a classic way to tell a story in the ring i thought yeah it, i liked it but i want to get to the next part <laughs> oh and- yeah so po- so post match um the beer money goes for handshakes with Neil and more. Neil Neil goes for it and he shakes the hand and then you see uh, more take a big drink of beer money's beer and I think we all know what's happening next. He comes up, he spits the beer in Bobby Roode's face and then escapes the ring. Neil does not like that at all and they argue the way to just the like, ramp. Dude, stop! What are you doing? <laughs> so I'm watching this and I'm just thinking it's f- weird. Like Shannon Moore just looks dumb. Well, even, even even Bobby Roode, who should be chasing that dude out of the building after getting beer spit in his face, is just like, bro, what the heck? Like, everyone's just like, what are you doing? Uh, it was just like really, yeah, it was, it was super just, childish. Everybody was just like calling out more for being a child, <laughs> even his own partner. Well, the, the part I actually wanted to get to, I forgot that happened, to be honest, was uh, the interview in the back oh, okay. with Ric Flair. And new metal Matt Hardy. Oh yeah, I'm calling him new metal Matt Hardy now because he looks like he should be in the band Corn. He looks like a, he looks like a, an extra in like a Corn music video, here. or a Limp Biscuit music video, or a Papa Roach music video. He is straight oh, new man. metal Matt. Here. Smack, and his eyes are barely. He's 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 fighting past an or ounce. Slipknot. Him That's what and I meant, him sorry. and Jeff are doing something in the back with Christy Hemme. Oh yeah. Uh, By the way, he's called Cold Blood Matt Hardy here, which uh, Ric Flair really likes because Matt's got cold blood. <laughs> Oh, oh that was hot. That's, yeah, yeah that's, that's uh, everyone's ears just got blown out. People are crashing their cars on the side of the road <laughs> after that. Uh, yeah, so there's a Matt backstage interview with Matt and Rick. Rick, of course, just cuts a great old promo. It's weird to see Rick managing Matt at this stage, but why the heck not? They're both in WWE. It's weird seeing that happen at all. Yeah, um, and they basically cut a promo and talk about how AJ Styles is a loser and how Matt is cold blooded Matt and how he's going to be cold blooded, uh, cold blooded win. And his eyes are like super low here. Matt? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's uh, he's he's struggling to stay awake. I do there's just certain pay-per-views and maybe we're just overanalyzing it because of, you know, what's what's to come, but there's just certain pay-per-views we've watched like New Blood Rising where like a quarter of the a quarter of the wrestlers in the show just look stoned or drunk or something. But the thing here is Matt Hardy still puts on a good match. Oh, yeah, of course. So and that's very different than so, what we'll see in the main event yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, and in New Blood Rising, they just look like they didn't care. Matt yeah. Hardy and AJ Styles put on a fantastic match. Yeah, and that was the next match. We got AJ Styles versus Matt Hardy. Um, this was, I'm going to say it right off the bat, my favorite match of the night. Um, this was prime AJ Styles as the face of TNA. The crowd Baby face, short ate hair. him up when he came out to the ring. And they even kind of liked Matt, I feel like. Uh, and it's funny, Matt's like very MySpace 2011 or like early Facebook looking like mm-hmm. Titan Tron was really funny as he came out. Um this match, they kind of are telling a story in the beginning. They were doing some mat based wrestling. There's a few botches. Um, I think I kind of enjoyed the exchange a, a little bit more than you guys did. And then it kind of picks up right away when uh, uh, Matt hits this huge spinning back elbow onto AJ. And he, he got all of it. And AJ kind of like threw his head. Like he really connected with that. Um, and then Matt gets sent outside by AJ. AJ goes for a dive. And this is the first time we see Ric Flair get involved in the match, which he'll get involved a little bit later on as well, a lot more actually. Um, but Ric Flair blocks the dive and then starts getting all Ric Flair'd on him. Like he's getting worked up in this match a lot. It's fun to see Ric Flair like getting all Ric Flairy, you know. Oh, and he's just randomly yelling throughout this match. Oh yeah, and he's wooing, he's yelling, he's, he's screaming strutting. at Earl Hebner. This is also not a no DQ match, and Ric Flair really just gets to do whatever. Yeah, the that's hell a he good wants. point. This is like a normal like. There's no stip in this match. This is a normal match, but Ric Flair is like getting involved and like hitting AJ right in front of Earl Hebner who does nothing about it 
He's wrestling royalty. He can do what he wants. I guess so. Old old man Earl Hebner, he, he's in full Danny Glover, I'm getting too old for this shit mode. Yeah, there was one point in the match when <laughs> Rick and AJ are like slap fighting outside of the ring, because that's essentially what it was. And then here comes Hebner. He's not going to deal with it. He starts slap fighting Flair. And what in the middle of this match, yeah, they're just Hebner shoving and each other, just man. fighting on the outside. But, be, but before that, we forgot to point out a great spot early in the match. They go out to the front, and Matt goes to Irish Whip, uh, AJ into the guardrail. AJ like baseball slides under, under the guardrail, guard rail. hits oh, yeah. his back when he's getting up though on it, then pops up, jumps off, and hits a phenomenal forearm. It was awesome, and that was right after he hit the apron moonsault too. Would you say it was phenomenal? I don't know. So f- here's the thing: so the phenomenal forearm happens when he springboards off of the ropes inside the ring. That was just uh, that was a very good forearm, but it wasn't a phenomenal forearm. Anything AJ Styles does is phenomenal, pal. Simply. Phenomenal. phenomenal, especially especially when he's got blonde highlights and he's baby faced AJ. Yeah, he had frosted tips or something going on here. He was looking good. <laughs> he was looking like the lost member of Insync during this match. Um, and twenty, and that, yeah, that that spot was really cool when he slid under the the barricade, which happened right after he hit an apron moonsault onto Matt too. But then, ap- so back to Rick and Earl like slap fighting. Later on in the match, uh, AJ's laying towards the side of the apron <laughs> and. Rick Flair just walks up, with, just grabs a handful of AJ's package and like twists the it. dick claw. He like walked over and he grabbed AJ by the dick and balls and just like st- it was like a mandible claw. So he with a vice dick. gripped him. He, he vice the, gripped him. That's the dick claw. Forever, I've seen a lot of dick known. trauma and obviously AJ's gone through a lot lately. But like I don't know if I've ever seen a man just like grab another man by the dick and just squeeze. Who it else was, but the dirtiest player in the game? Yeah. Um, and then near that, there was a cool spot when uh, AJ got catapulted into the ropes, which you do see a bit, but it, there was a lot of impact on it. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, with, <laughs> with AJ as he kind of gets choked on the ropes. Um, Matt hits a side effect for a near fall, and then it twists to fake gets countered into a uh, backslide for a near fall. A Styles Clash gets countered into an Alabama Slam. And then there's a really cool spot here where AJ hit a moonsault and then he like rolled over and hit like a reverse dragon sleeper for a while. Yeah. Uh, that was really cool, which Matt did eventually get to the ropes. Rick gets involved some more. He gets uh, a Pele kick. Yeah, for his the, right here, Rick yep. eats a Pele kick. A kind of an awkward Pele kick, and then Rick kind of just well, like. Yeah, because I, AJ, I feel like he was like halfway across the ring when he tried hitting him with it. And if you ever see a 65 year old man fall out of a ring, it's like, very uncomfortable. He like, he like bounces down and like falls onto the apron and then rolls the rest of the way out. Well, especially when. When you have a guy like Ric Flair who cannot land on his back, he has to like land on his side with everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he eats that, and then AJ turns around, which causes enough for the distraction. He gets the DDT. Matt Hardy hits a beautiful moonsault for a near fall. Yeah, I don't dude. know the last time I saw Hardy hit a something, moonsault. Something out of Jeff's book. Yeah, he hit a very like textbook uh, mm-hmm. moonsault, and then... Uh, Matt goes back up to the top rope to do something else, but doesn't get there because he gets a Pele kick on the top rope, which was really cool. Um and then AJ climbs to the top rope, hits a 450 corkscrew. Uh, really nice, nicely executed. A there. Spinal tap, they call this. Spinal tap. He goes for the pinfall. Rick's trying to get involved at this point, and Hebner's just had enough, and he's just like pushing him away. Wall count. Wall doing the three count. And he's he like blocking three. out Ric Flair. It was awesome. I've it's never seen. I've never seen anything like this, but I kind of liked it. Yeah. Because, because the ref is like showing his authority here yeah. and being like, "Don't fuck with me, Rick." Yeah, they were in the right. They were in the right spot, and they executed it really well. And Hebner counted the three, and AJ gets the win. It's really like if you're thinking about it, I'm thinking in my mind like these two live in the old folks' home together, and Rick Rick keeps taking Earl's cookie, and Earl is just so goddamn irritated For with sure. Rick. It's like they're both in Legends House. Yeah, just but, losing uh, it. And then after the match, AJ just walks around the ring, gets on his knee. And just nuts the shit just out of Rick. Nutter Kick cuts City. Him. Just oh. nutter cuts him. Yeah, and then just walks away like he's pissed. Straight revenge, man. This was my match of the night. Mm-hmm. I love this match. I'm going to give it four stars. Um, so AJ Styles looked really good. Matt, who, granted, outside of kind of the big spots, was always a little bit more limited in the ring, but I thought he looked fantastic in this match as well. Uh, this was easily the match of the night for me. Uh, if you're going to watch one match from the show... Maybe make it this one, but maybe make it the main event too. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm also going to agree four stars. This match was really good. Yeah. Don't don't worry about the main event. That's You want to watch that for a different reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This match was really, really good. This was really solid. Um, and, and Matt Hardy looks like he doesn't give a shit, like in the interview, but he pulls out all the stops. And oh, I, yeah. I said this before that I think Matt Hardy is a creative genius, and I think 
here he's trying s- an, this cold-blooded gimmick where he just is kind of an asshole. Like a like yeah. a new metal Matt Hardy. This was really... so. I mean, AJ Styles, I could talk about him all night. Oh, yeah. He is so... I mean, AJ, he's over 40 years old, and the things that he does in the ring in WWE, even today, like defy anything you think a man his age should be able to do. And just to look at a younger version of that same person, I mean, younger, he's still in his 30s at this point, well into his 30s, but he is just so good. You could put anybody in the ring and with AJ Styles. Yeah. You could put Danny Bonaduce in the ring with, with AJ Styles. I mean, he had a good match with uh, Frank Trigg, with James Ellsworth. <laughs> So that's what I was going to say is that he's he's so much like Shawn Michaels in that even no matter who you're throwing out there, he's going to do everything he can to sell his ass off and to make them look good. And granted, Matt Hardy tried to rise to his level too, and that only helped it. But you kind of feel pressured when you're going up against AJ Styles or Shawn Michaels to give your 100% and try to blow that or try to tear the house down. Definitely. So I asked this question earlier. Mm. AJ has to be your TNA MVP of oh, all time. Yes. Right? So if we're doing the, are you no going to ask question. about the Rushmore? Yeah, so if you're doing a Mount Rushmore of TNA, AJ Styles is on everyone's board, right? It has to be. Yeah. So like, if you don't have AJ on your Mount Rushmore of TNA, you've never you're watched wrong. TNA. Yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, who's the next three? I think it's got to be, and I've been thinking about this, I think it's got to be AJ, Daniels, mm-hmm. Angle, maybe Joe. Mm-hmm. That's probably who I'd put on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would put, I do, I do AJ, Christopher Daniels, Samoa Joe, and then either Kurt Angle or Sting. I, I, I have to choose between one of them. I got to go with AJ, of course. Then you have to go with Sting because he was the first huge superstar TNA got. Then you got to go with Kurt Angle because he took them to the next level. And then I'm, I, I got three guys for my last spot. Daniels for obvious reasons. Joe for obvious reasons, or Abyss for being the one guy that has stayed yeah, I mean, I true. Consistent. Abyss, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's Mr. Consistent. He was the Sting of yeah, TNA. You, like Sting was the WCW, or Tommy Dreamer was the ECW, or Kane to WWE. Yeah. That's Abyss to TNA. Yeah, he, he was, had, he's always around. He had a chance to leave, but he stayed to try to help TNA get to the next level, and he's had great matches. Dude, he's still there. Yeah, he exactly. But if if I had to pick one, I'd probably go Joe. See, I'm trying to think about it from a way of like the reason I didn't put Sting on mine, and it's a little bit hypocritical because I put Kurt Angle, was because I tend to put more of the stars that they kind of made or that they thrust into the limelight. So AJ, for obvious reasons, I mean Joe, who had been around, but Joe really kind of cut his teeth in, in TNA. The reason I put Angle on there was because he took TNA and elevated them to a huge level, and Sting did too. Sting definitely did too. I think my reasoning was just wanting to put the homegrown guys, and for that reason, maybe I replace Angle with Abyss. Yeah, it, it's an interesting conversation. It's, it's mm-hmm. a really mm-hmm. tough one because, you know, WWE of course has an even broader, like, variety of guys to choose from. So TNA's is, you know, a lot less. To yeah, choose more from. streamlined. Yeah, but TNA still has some very good options, including Jeff Jarrett, James Storm, Bobby Roode. I mean, Chris Sabin might even Chris, be on there. Chris Sabin, Ethan Carter, yeah. Matt Hardy. Yeah. Yeah, and, it's it's tough. And you could even say Austin Aries. Oh, for sure. You mm. could easily say Austin and Aries. Sammy Callahan, he's tearing it up right now. Eli Drake, they got some good guys right now. Um, I will say, going back right quick to Matt Hardy versus AJ Styles. So I did give it three and three quarter stars. Um, Sorry. No, no, no. No, it's <laughs> fine, pal. I, I really didn't. I, I love Mount Rushmore. We could do top fives or top fours all the time. Hey, even if you're subscribed to the YouTube uh, channel, there may be some of that content coming your way yes, soon. Yes, yes. Okay, so here... So this is cold-blooded Matt. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who it was more of an injection or a revival for when uh, Matt Hardy became Broken Matt. Whether it was more of an injection to TNA to keep them afloat until Don Callis got there, or if it was more of a just a revival of Matt Hardy's career because he is in gimmick purgatory here. You, so, you almost have to say it. it it's both. It's both, but I think if you have to, if if you're gonna twist my arm and make me choose one. I'm going with him saving Impact as mm-hmm. like the bigger mm-hmm. beneficiary of that. And obviously, Matt Hardy revitalized his career. But I think if you look at Matt, like he always was going to have somewhere to go, whether it was back to WWE for one run, whether it was to Ring of Honor. Uh, with Without, without you know, if, if he had never done the broken thing, somebody would have taken him. He saved an entire promotion. He did, yeah. yeah. He Almost did. single-handedly. Hey, and Billy Corgan, you too, buddy. Yeah, friend of the but, podcast. But... With Matt Hardy, like you said, he always has a home to go to. Mm-hmm. But 
this match is a match that shows that Matt Hardy is not done. That Matt Hardy has more the good wrestler. matches in him. The wrestler, yeah, yeah. So, so Matt Hardy could have gone wherever he wanted. Yeah. And, and still had a, a decent run. His WWE run was great. This last one with, when he won the titles with Jeff, then kind of disappeared and then kind of got broken and had a t- nice tag run with Bray. And it seems like he's kind of injured now. Who knows what's going to happen Apparently in the future. Apparently he's training to be an agent is what uh, all I, signs point to. I really hope we get one more run, one more uh I want at least broken. one more final deletion. Yeah, one more final deletion because that stuff is magic, man. I would. I love the one they did with Bray and and Vince. You know, letting them pull the trigger on that and and it was it, it popped the ratings and they never let him do another one. I know we're super off track right now, but I love the like tag team turmoil one that they had in TNA. Oh, Apocalyptico. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. and like uh, the Midnight Express. The Midnight Express with the <laughs> Road Warrior Animal was randomly there. Hornswoggle was randomly there. It was they threw uh, Shane Helms. Who was managing the Colta Lee, I think is what their names are. Trevor Lee and the other guy. I can't remember his name. Um, and they threw Hurricane, or Helms in there. And he popped back out as, I believe, three count. And then back out as Hurricane. <laughs> and and the, the, when he came out as three count, though, they were all dancing to the old three count music. And it was just wild, man. Yeah, it, it man. Thanks, Matt Hardy, for for all. Yeah, for all thank that. you so much, man. Uh, and for what, what? For what? At if first, this is the end of your career, yeah, like for what at first I thought was an abomination, I had to watch the whole thing and then realized it was a masterpiece. So Matt, thank you for doing what no one else has done before. Matt, I'm telling you right now, if you're listening, I've been behind the broken Matt Hardy shit from day one. Yep. And Luke can Same. vouch for that. Yeah, yeah. Because I ordered Pop TV when you and Ethan Carter were feuding over the title. When you were big money, Matt. When you were big money, yeah. Matt, just to watch you. Anyways. Um, yes, moving on from that. Love you. Moving on from that. Great positive experience to the third of three honeymoon segments. And uh, this got, like, from cringiest, to cringier to cringiest very quickly um, because uh, it's, it's clear it's clear that Karen is very annoyed and she's not having a good time. And Karen's uh, ready to divorce him already because he invited all the kids. Yeah, and so he misunderstands that as meaning I miss him too. And and I well say, I, saying there's something missing yeah, for this honeymoon. Yeah, and and then he said, "I miss him too." I sunk in my seat. I miss Kurt. What the hell is this crap? And then we're just gonna move on. Yeah, and he did say something about impact on Thursday. I'm gonna bring Kurt back. Who cares? That was really it was stupid. And it all was three so of those cringy. were terrible. And we get a we get a Mr. Anderson promo. Yep, and then Mr. Anderson's in the back, and I and I I pretty much forced Luke to like copy this promo verbatim because it was weird and wacky i do have to say though mr anderson rules i'm not a fan anderson i've never been i wasn't a fan as as kennedy and i'm not a fan as i just don't think he was a very good wrestler he wasn't a bad wrestler he was able he was very charismatic anderson i'll say that this way he couldn't really get a good match at rvd uh how was that but, promo so th- so this promo um i think his gimmick here is like he's just he's self-proclaimed an asshole he's an asshole yeah well, he says shirt. on his hat and yeah, his shirt. Yeah, yeah yeah and so i mean i think the crowd i mean he he refers to the crowd as assholes as well but uh here's here's some uh notable quotes from this one um it's really just focused around how he's been screwed out of uh, number one contendership for the title and so on and so on so he's referring to dixie carter here the president of this company really really got screwed and then he's like oh wait that could be misconstrued and christy hemi's going along with it like uh-huh uh and then he's like they really really put the bone to her uh, uh they put the wood to her uh uh, oh, okay. Well, and then, then like later on, he cuts a whole promo on RVD that's kind of lame, and then <laughs> finishes it with, "I'm an asshole, but there's a huge, huge difference between being an asshole and a douchebag." And then he does this weird thing that's almost like Scott Steiner's percentages: <laughs> nice guys finish last, bad guys finish last, douchebags finish dead last, but assholes always, always always finish first it was so weird it was so weird like i like kind of the first like the sexual innuendo stuff like i'm usually not a fan of that like kind of style of of promo or whatever but i did think that was pretty funny and then he went on to talk i i and i don't know if this was intentionally funny or not but when he said there's a big difference between being a douchebag and an asshole like that popped me. Uh, I laughed at that, and then like it just like went off the rails at the end. I don't know if he forgot his line or if oh he had to. Have. That was just he, that's what he was supposed to say. But it was like what? so everyone. No, dude. He said he said like very very and then really really and <laughs> yeah. then always always always. There's no way. Um, I think he was just trying to. Film. Yeah, and so that led into a r- odd video package. 
Can I share a Mr. Anderson story, please? Absolutely. Um, so I mentioned previously uh, Everett, or excuse me, a, a TNA house show in Everett that I went to, and uh, one of my favorite memories of that was Mr. Anderson was there, and <laughs> and he comes out. Um, the, we're just in some random little arena, some little uh, I don't know what you call it, just a little arena, and he comes into the in, into the ring, and usually the mic drops down from the ceiling for him to talk to. Well, he puts his hand up as if a mic's going to drop down. There's nothing. And then all of a sudden, you see this little uh, this little tech guy from the back who's super short with a little footstool. And <laughs> he runs into the ring, puts the footstool on the ground, stands on top of the footstool, and then, like, puts the mic over Kennedy's mouth. Like, puts the mic above his head <laughs> so he can cut the whole promo. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and I, I loved That's that. That's pretty funny. It, it was cheesy. What did you guys think of the video package that led into this match? I thought, so it was really interesting that they kind of did it with a different style where it was like really candid interviews, almost like something you'd see on like a WWE Network backstage exclusive. It looked like they were bothering Rob Van Dam. Yeah, Rob Van Dam. He was just like, trying to stretch, he man. He was like trying to stretch before like clearly like before an impact taping and like it was obvious that like a producer came up to him and was like, talk about your match coming up with Mr. Anderson. Um we're going to put like, this in the pay-per-view. He's I, like, okay, I did, dude. I did think it started out really interesting and like I kind of like the back and back and forth exchange. Like it made it felt really real and like not in like the stupid like Vince Russo like work shoot way, but it just like it felt legit and it kind of went on a little bit too long I thought towards the end where like they maybe cut back to each man maybe one or two one or two too many times. Well, that is just like RVD is just being super casual. He might be coming down from a high or something. <laughs> might and just, be. And, he, yeah, <laughs> and he's just like, yeah, I just, I'm just feeling really screwed over, man. And I just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come after him. I'm just, I'm gonna beat Mr. Anderson. I loved it. The actual friend of the podcast, Rob Van Dam, by the way. The whole effing <laughs> show liked our tweet. Yes. yes. Thanks, RVD. We love you. Um. So then that led into the match, uh, RVD versus Mr. Anderson, which is officially for number one contendership. Mr. Anderson does this whole spiel on the way out to the ring. Um, which is awkward because he's just like, this asshole is going to beat that guy. guy. <laughs> like he forgot what he was going to um, call him. It was a douchebag, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it was a douchebag. But then he did get the crowd back into it when he did Mr. Anderson two times. He had to say it twice, of course. Anderson! And he did it again. Go ahead. Anderson um, from Green Bay, Wisconsin. I thought this match would be better than it turned out to be. Uh, mostly because RVD, I think RVD is great, and he's obviously one of my favorites of all time. And I'm not just saying that because he's uh, likes our tweets. Likes our tweets. Uh, he really is one of my favorites, even going back to ECW. I thought this was going to be a better match than it was. It was really disappointing to me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Two guys just don't just have, don't have that, it together. That was the and case. I, here. I don't think either one of these guys are bad wrestlers, or maybe it's just the night. You know, I know they've wrestled again, so I'm I'm sure it was better than this. It just seemed like the two of them were not on the same. So, page. Yeah, something just felt off. It started with a uh, with another mat based wrestling that there was a couple of big botches, and the one that really stuck with me was RVD went for a leapfrog over uh, Mr. Anderson, but just came down right on Anderson. Other way, other way around. Was it the other way around? Yeah, Anderson tried to leapfrog him and then just landed on RVD's yeah, head. Yeah, it, it looked bad. No, I'm pretty sure it was RVD. Was it? That's yeah, two that's to one, I bud. I thought so. No, because Anderson like went into the corner and was like, "I meant to do that." That was about something else. Oh uh, my god! That so was, they, yeah, it was botcha mania out there. Yeah, there was a lot of botches to start, and then there was a uh, rolling senton by RVD after a spin kick. Um, Anderson rolled outside uh, to kind of avoid getting pinned and then he got hit with a baseball slide by RVD. They both end up outside of the ring. Um, RVD sets uh, Mr. Anderson on the barricade and then he gets on the apron and goes for a big spinning heel kick and Mr. Anderson moves and this looked gnarly because RVD just crashed with his leg into this barricade. For a split second I thought Rob Van Dam broke his it leg. It looked great. Um, this was like the cool spot in the match I thought. And then we got the classic heel working over the babyface's body part. Essentially for the rest of the match. Uh, there was a single leg bust and crab spot. Uh, you know, uh, RVD got his leg thrown into the turnbuckle on the outside. Uh, just a lot of, uh, of things like that. RVD did hit a, hit a big uh, drop kick. He did get some um, offense in after that. And then both men go back outside. Uh, there was a double down in the ring before that. And then a double headbutt in the ring before that. And then they went back to the outside. RVD still selling his leg. Um uh, Mr. Anderson had went for his finish, which they were calling, not the mic drop, the mic check. Um, the crowd didn't, like, 
on didn't the, buy on the it. Ramp. Is that didn't buy to? it at all. Oh, he tried to do it in the ring several times, okay. and the crowd just didn't buy it for it. They weren't getting. They weren't into this match mm-hmm. at all. Um, and then eventually they do get outside. Mr. Anderson does hit the mic check onto RVD on the ramp. Both men are dead. Um, like RVD was motionless. He was really selling that well. Um, both men are dead. Neither men can beat the ten count, and the match ends in a draw. Uh, the crowd did not like that. Uh, there was a chant of restart match no yeah <laughs> like, uh, battling yeah it was bad the crowd did not like the finish nor did i and i understand why you have to sometimes do screw job finishes in order to keep a feud going um so i'm not going to be too critical of it i just thought the match in general was kind of boring again and i said this on our new blood rising episode i just have a really hard time buying into the uh heel working over a specific body part of the baby face i just think it tends to slow down matches and make them boring and that was the case here uh coupled with a sloppy f- with a, a non-finish i'm gonna give it two stars i gave it two stars as well zach pretty much hit everything on the head right there yeah two stars um i mean you just saw certain points where like rvd had that backflip you know the the signature backflip and then he goes for the the tackle in the corner but his backflip seemed to step slow they just they both just seemed kind of out of it and we didn't really talk about this with how crappy uh, new blood rising was you gotta wonder uh, with what we're about to talk about in the main event how much people know what's going on backstage and how much that's affecting them and their attitude going into it and the work they're going to put so in. so i totally understand where you're coming from with that but just a theory but i i don't think it would really affect them um all that much just because they are kind of i feel like wrestlers in that moment are kind of and they obviously they care about the entire show as a whole but i feel like for the most part and this is just speculation i haven't talked to a wrestler but i feel like they're kind of focused on making their match the best that it can be rather than worried about well, and i think it all depends on the personality maybe too and depending how much of the backstage politics i mean in wcw new blood rising like obviously that was bleeding over to everybody yeah whereas in tna i think this was kind of isolated for now um also if you're going to do a double count out it's got to be more brutal than that to be honest it's got to be more of not not necessarily blood but they, it's got to be a slobber knocker. so i understand yeah, so I, that's actually a really good point I understand why RVD couldn't make it back up and, and come in in time because he ate like a vicious. Basically, it's like a reverse Russian leg sweep mm-hmm. where RVD got his head driven into the like the steel ramp. Like I understand a downward spiral. Yeah, I, I understand. Think. Yeah, I understand why RVD can't make it in. But why did why couldn't Mr. Anderson make it in? He didn't take that much punishment in this match. He just couldn't make it back in in time. It was just lame. It was yeah. It was forgettable. And two stars for me. Um, and next up, we get a, another lengthy video package hyping up the main event, <laughs> which is next: Sting versus Jeffrey Hardy for the TNA World Championship. An ugly title, by the way. Just as an aside, it's a, like the Hardy special. This thing just lo- looks. It looks like something you'd see somebody wearing on Mardi Gras. <laughs> yeah, you're totally yeah. Right. The title's gross, but I do want to. I have something written down in my notes that I, I have circled like eight times. Um, Jerry Borash is doing the ring announcing for this match. And, man, what what a guy. That dude. For real. That yeah, dude he... stayed there for so long. He put They put him through some shit stuff on TV, but he always stayed there, worked his ass off, hyped the crowd. What a guy. I'm and he's glad- getting he's getting his he's getting his due now. Yeah. he's one of going to be one of the big creative guys with WWE. It looks like going I'm, forward. I'm glad WWE is giving him the chance because he deserves it. He he worked his yeah. ass off. I think right now he's in NXT working closely with Triple H. Yep, so good yep. for him. And he he was also one of the masterminds behind behind uh, the Broken, Broken, Broken Matt Hardy's. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if anybody saw this, but him and Abyss had a fun match with Scott Steiner and Josh Matthews. Yes, where where Scott Steiner. Is end up ends up in a golf cart chasing a bitch <laughs> yelling, "I'm gonna get you, fat ass!" A lot of people being called <laughs> fat ass on Impact Wrestling. Yeah. Um. So we do get to the main event. So Jeff Hardy's music starts playing for an uncomfortable amount of time, and there's no Jeff Hardy, and there's a lot of smoke. Yeah. A lot of smoke. No Hardy. Eventually, he saunters his way out. He stumbles, stumbling he, around. He tries to go up the stairs after having like a brief tug of war with a fan over a poster. Yeah, over poster. a flag. No, they had a flag, dude. Okay, he yeah. tried stealing a fan's yeah, flag. He tried yeah, he tried stealing this fan's flag, and then he tried to walk up the stairs and almost fell off the stairs. Yeah, um, he was, it was very obvious from the second he he made his appearance on the entrance ramp that he was in no shape to compete. Um, at least to me, it became very obvious, and he kind of sauntered out to the ring, he came in, he flips off the crowd, and here comes Sting. Sting, you can tell, is peeved, 
the second you he gets to the ring, you can tell he's annoyed. You look at Sting, and if you've ever pissed off your dad to the point where you get that, <laughs> I'm not mad. I'm just he had disappointed. the disappointed dad look. He oh. had he had this look that Stan used to give me back in the day when I did something <laughs> stupid. Like, yeah, he he just looked so disappointed and, and peeved, and so they're getting ready to start the match, and then here comes Eric Bischoff, who runs up to the ring and says he's going to make a little change. He whispers something to Jeff, who is clearly telling them that the that the match is basically called off. And the, Eric has to like force a handshake out of Jeff. Like Jeff's yeah. just kind of like looking there, and yeah. Eric's just like shake my hand. Um, we're very, supposed very, to be a team. And, we're in a faction yeah. together. And very famously, what he told the men was it's going to be a scorpion death drop in the one two three. Um, he kind of told that to both men. He stalled for time and then said, this match is now going to be a no DQ. Have fun. He leaves. The oh, match- he, he gets punched by Sting. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, Sting, gets, Sting yeah. punches him out. But, okay, so you're in a situation here. One, you got to feel bad for Eric. Oh, I feel because, terrible for Eric. Yeah. Because Eric, Eric runs out here, and you can tell in this promo he has no idea what he's going to say. Just stalling. He's really just blowing smoke up the crowd's ass trying to get it. Badly. And, but, but two... Why? Why? Why not send someone out? You have Anderson and RVD. We just we talked about this. Why not send one of them or both of them down to make it? You had an out with the count out. You could have sent, and obviously this would have to have. They would have to have made major creative tweaks going forward. But you had an out where you could have been like, well, neither of us won. We won our match right now, and you could have easily made it a fatal four way or a three way and get Jeff out of there. Uh, and done it that and then had Sting retain still. But, I mean, I understand. Their hands were tied. They had to come up with this on the fly because they didn't even know where Jeff was until about, what, 10 minutes before the match well, was supposed think, to start? I think the idea I have, I had, was you could have had Mr. Anderson, the heel, come back down and maybe attack Jeff and then say, me and RVD tied, so I we both get a title shot. Here we go, and then you could put a ten minute match out there yeah. between Sting and Mr. Anderson. I feel like that's what WWE today in today's would have done. They would have done a kayfabe. Jeff got taken out backstage. Right. Don't even let Jeff. Jeff should never have been at the entrance ramp when people saw the stadium but was in. It also should have never got to this point, which is why I feel bad for Eric Bischoff because Jeff Hardy should be a professional. And and to be fair, he has turned his life around seemingly. I mean, he right. had the DUI this was, this was last rock year, bottom. but this was yeah. this was rock bottom for Jeff and. But and it's sad for everybody, but Jeff should have been accountable for his own actions 100%. My, my thing is, too, yep. though, you have an arena full of people here to see you and Sting. Like, you... A marquee matchup, yeah, big time. And you go get so fucked up that you have a 1 minute and 30 second match? That's not all right. And, yes, I know he's cleaned up, but that that's fucked up. That sullied my opinion of Jeff for several years after that. Me too, because I was always somebody that defended Jeff. Same. Because I'd be like, you know, he always makes it out there. He's not like Scott Hall. He always makes his shows. I mean, occasionally, I guess he'll probably miss one. But yeah. he, he always shows up ready to wrestle, and he, he did not. And between the look in Bischoff's eyes, Sting's eyes, the fans' eyes, the referee's eyes... He let a lot of people down. Everyone's embarrassed to be there. And he's the face of the company at this time. You know, he's not just a mid-carder. He's the main event. Yeah, he's the face he's of the, the company. The, the, title, the title is is his design. Yeah. And Sting and Sting is one of the most legendary wrestlers in the business. And you're gonna you're gonna do you're gonna do a veteran and elder statesman of the business like that? Yeah, it's and he's lucky that he was working with Sting. Yeah, we were talking about that. Such a consummate professional because I think a more hot-headed competitor would have laid Jeff out for reals. I know I would not have been able to keep my cool in that situation, but I do need to throw out now. Jeff is doing a lot better, doing some doing some great stuff, and we're not we're not ragging on Jeff as a person. No, I love Jeff Hardy because Jeff's great. I love both the Hardy boys very much. Both both but, Hardys were going through some stuff at the time, and it just happened to hit rock bottom for Jeff at this moment in front of a pay per view crowd on live television, and but it's unfortunate. He kind of started the sinking ship of TNA there. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was Be- kind of the beginning of the downfall because that match could have been something special. Yeah, you know. Oh yeah, for but sure. I guess I'll talk about what we did get. Um, okay, so the bell rings. The two men grapple a little Hold bit. Hold on, he, he oh. teases the he like tries to throw his shirt to oh, every yeah. corner of the crowd for like thirty seconds. Yeah, nothing happened. The, the bell rings and essentially nothing happens. He's pretending to throw the shirt. Uh, Taz at one point says, "I don't know what the hell Jeff Hardy is doing here," which uh, I feel you, buddy. I feel like that just came out. Like that was just his real thoughts in that moment. Well, he 
Taz is also a professional. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So the two men, I mean, and by the way, kudos to everybody for keeping it as professional as they did. If this had this happened, imagine this happening in WCW in 2001. Imagine this happening in ECW. The show would have came off the rails. Everybody mm-hmm. kept their cool mm-hmm. so well. So what happened was they end up grappling. Um, Sting gets Hardy in the middle, hits him with the Scorpion Death Drop forces Jeff Hardy to the three count. You can clearly see Hardy's shoulders aren't even down. He's trying to kick out and they count the three count anyway. The match is over. Sting gets the belt. This is when he really looks like peak disappointed dad. Well, Sting grabs Jeff by the hair and it looks like he is yanking oh, yeah. Jeff's hair. And when he, hits he that, drives him under that yeah, when he When he hits that scorpion death drop, it looks like he put a little bit extra force in it. Oh, he definitely did. As, mm-hmm. As like a you're in timeout. Yeah. I almost wish the disappointed dad Sting would have took his belt off and just started whooping his ass. <laughs> so he gets the three count. Um, and at this point, I mean, Sting's not even trying to hide the fact that he's pissed. That this was real. I think everybody in the arena knew it was real. This wasn't a WCW Vince Russo uh, work shoot. This mm-hmm. was real, and I think everybody knew it. Uh, the crowd started chanting bullshit, and then just the, I think just the moment that sums up this match perfectly was Sting looking out of the crowd and just saying, I agree. And he has this look in his face and he just leaves. And that's the end of the show. And another thing again, Eric Bischoff did his best to stall. Yeah, clearly mm-hmm. hindsight's twenty twenty, and we can... We, we can, can speculate as much as we want, yeah. dude. But it's such a tough call. Er- to Eric's, Eric's up there trying to figure something out because, mm-hmm. you know, he's cutting this promo and... You know, he's, while, we, here's the interesting thing: is he's cutting the promo while he's telling the competitors what's going to happen in this match, and it looks like he's drawing it out as long as he can in case they can find a plan B. But I guess you know we're using the hindsight as 2020, and you have like a four minute window here to make your mind to up. make to make make a plan. And That's it, especially because they didn't know where Jeff Hardy was. Yeah, see, for me. And again, hindsight. For me, that would have been the tip off to okay, maybe we need to figure out a plan B if if our main event competitor isn't even in the you building. Know, you know, you have Jeff Jarrett on his honeymoon. You That's could have true. just had him come over. I think, and I'm pretty sure he was Steve. right across the street at Universal Studios. You could yeah, have so, had him come over. Th- there's a lot of different things they could have done, but again, hindsight is twenty twenty. So they handled it for what it was. Everybody handled everything like exceptionally well. Except for Jeff Hardy. Except for Jeff Hardy. Everyone kept their cool. Um I can't imagine being in Jeff Hardy's shoes now, having to look back, and that moment is is on is on DVDs and it's on tape and it's etched in people's memories forever. Yeah, it's a stain um, on the business. I can't imagine the embarrassment he must feel even to this day about that. But kudos to him for turning everything around. We do have to give him credit for that. I guess we have to rate this match. It's getting a zero for me. Uh, it was nothing. This is a flat out dead. Um, I'm gonna give this a point oh eight stars. Which is the legal blood alcohol limit that you can have yeah, was, in the state of Washington? Jesus, uh, poor, poor, poor taste. But so you know. that's so how the show. That's how the show ends. Uh, we get a highlight reel at the end of the show. Um, overall, I think this definitely had some good. It had a lot of bad. Uh, it had some exciting matches. It had some boring matches. It was a mixed show. You it know? was very. It, it was. It the, was a C show for me. You know the uh, the shrugging emo- emoji or the emoticon. That's like what the show was personified. There's definitely a couple things in here that I think fans should go check out. <laughs> Ex- I, I think I think fans of the Young Bucks especially should go check out the Ultimate X match. Yep, and then I think this. I think you'll enjoy that. I think. The AJ Matt Hardy match is the best match. If you on want here. to see young AJ and somewhat young Matt, I mean, still able to do a lot more than he can. So now. Yeah. I, I would say check that out. And, and even would, the even the beer money versus yeah, yeah. Kink. Yep. And I think that was a good match. And even for some of you guys that like Bully Ray and Tommy Dreamer, I would check out that yeah. match. Um, but there, those matches are very good. But then there's the other matches are very bad. Yeah, it's it's very much an up and down show. Um, I'm gonna give it a C plus overall. I don't think it was bad. It was average. It was C for me it, it was just it was clunky and there are there were some redeeming moments but it, it was clunky it's not a can't miss but it's not a can't walk like you have to watch but it's not don't watch yeah i so, think it, there's definitely it's definitely worth watching for a few reasons and again this is kind of similar to new blood rising where i think any like wrestling fan should go on youtube or should get the dvd and just watch how that main event transpires because for somebody who's interested in kind of the ins and outs of the business it's Especially fascinating the pinnacles, the pinnacles yeah it's fascinating to see something kind of uh escalate so quickly right in front of your eyes it's really fascinating uh, but it's also 
very unfortunate. For better or for worse, it's it's a big part of wrestling. It's history. entertainment. It's a big part of wrestling history. So that being said, next week we have WWE No Mercy. It's from Portland, Oregon, two thousand six. Two thousand six. Yeah. Yep. yep. Chris Jericho versus Shawn Michaels in a ladder match. Who, that should be fun. Who was there, uh, Kyle? I was there and was the person who requested the show, Colin Vassarino. Nice. So me and him were there, and he requested the show, and we're gonna. He's the first one that's getting a request show. Have you watched the Have you watched this show since you've been there? I haven't watched the whole show, but I've watched the main event match. I don't think I've ever seen the show. Me this, neither. This main event is incredible. Guys. I'm sure it is. I can't. I don't wait. know. This is one of my favorite matches ever, and that's I awesome. was so lucky to be there for this cool. match. I also I want to say this is we've done four shows now with four different promotions. We did WWE, WCW, ECW, TNA. So we're going back to WWE. I'm excited to do it. Uh, just thank you, everybody, for listening. Oh, yeah. Um, get us to 500 likes. Yeah, let's get to 500 likes. We're, We're so close. Also, send us some messages. Who's on your TNA Mount Rushmore? Yes. What shows, we, would, we would love to hear feedback what, from you guys. We're lonely. Talk to us, please. What shows please. do you want to see, and why do you think winter is one of the most gorgeous TNA knockouts of all time? Uh, we're very friendly. We want to talk KLK to you guys. Underrated. Um, we love all you guys who are listening. Like Really, we mean that. Like This has been such a wild ride. Uh, we're a month in now. And this has just been so much fun, and we hope we can keep climbing this mountain and we can make something of this. Buy a shirt, like us on Facebook, talk to us. We love you. Hogamaniacs, we love you, brothers. Hogamania is running wild. Hey, yeah, let's do this. <laughs>